is it's it's the hope in any sort of therapeutic process or anything that you get a healthier experience. So we really want to kind of create this healthier, this healthy family type experience where um, if you check out for for a few months, no worries. We're not judging you. We don't, we don't mind. Come back when you feel like it. Like the the ideal family doesn't intrude. Like they stay in the background. They're there for you when um, you need them, and they're um, you know what they're going to be on your side. Um, and they're they're not in your business, and they're they're not intrusive. But they're right. You that so that's our hope is to be that way. Um, we also are always intending to be inclusive. If we ever say or do anything that um, ex- makes you feel excluded, we hope you let us know about that because that we don't want that and we want to correct that. I know um, I've heard from many people, especially moderators, about how language or word choices have ended up making people feel excluded, and we've evolved and tried to correct for that. So. In a in a healthy family, nobody is excluded. Um, so that's we want that. We also what we're always going for is for you to to be centered, validated, live your best life, be your health and happiness is what's the most important to us. And sometimes that means putting someone else first is going to make you happy or be better for you, but we want to give the advice and we're hoping in your small groups, you're always saying things that are in service of the person's best self, best, you know, kind of the, what they're wanting. We're valid. We're not trying to tell people to want different things than they want. We're trying to just help and validate what they want and believe them that they know what's best for themselves. Um, we want to always provide enough structure so that it feels predictable, safe, easy um, to interact with, but you know, loose enough that take it for what it is. Use it how you will. We're nothing here. We don't want to be uh, too rigid in, in what we have. And everything in the realm of mental health and psychology is, you know, thing, thing everything has... Um, Oh, wiggle room, different meaning for different people, different meaning in different contexts. So just take it as it's useful for you. Um, so jumping in to some stuff about family systems. One of the most important things to see and recognize for yourself is whatever you had is your version of normal. Whatever was going on around you is all you knew until you were old enough to have the critical thinking skills and to look around and see things were different in other places or for different families. For a lot of us, it's, it wasn't until we were like high school age or older adolescents, young adults, that we would have spent time in different families, right? A lot of times when you're little, you, you're there. You're, you can't get yourself out of from a, to a different place. You're in that family. Um, and so that's all you know. What Whatever you grew up with is normal for you. Um, and that is an important idea because whether you've departed from that, kind of whatever direction you've gone in, you need, you need to understand your, where, what your baseline was. Um, it's meaningful. One of the, the reason I have the fishbowl on here is because that's what a family is, you don't see that you're in the fishbowl when you're the fish. You, d- you can't possibly have a, a view on it that has a healthy perspective or a healthy distance. All you can see is what's in front of you. Like the, it's So that's really important to know, too. That's so central in um, our experience in a lot of ways is we only – we didn't see a whole picture. We only saw a little tiny piece um, like the fish in the fishbowl. Our families are like their own culture. They're influenced by larger cultures, maybe ethnic cultures, American culture, Canadian culture, all kinds of other influences. But in themselves, they're a, a little microculture. They have their own ways of doing things. They have their own ways of talking about things or not talking about things. 
religion can be a piece of it, what you eat, how you interact socially, music, art, all of these things are unique to your family or dictated in your family. The way you behave, your values, what things mean to you are about your family of origin, what you learned in your family. They, they are genuinely, and for most of us, sadly, the primary influence in our lives. It's the it's sort of, if you use uh, the theater analogy of we're actors on the stage, our family has set the stage. They've organized what we're going to be interacting with, where we're going to be interacting with, who we're going to be act- interacting with. And the vast, almost everything there was out of our control. And that's important for us to, to know too. We, so all these things were going on that we had no control over and we didn't even really notice. Um, Dr. Bowen, Murray Bowen is the, is the dude who uh, in as late as the fifties really introduced this idea of family systems theory and systems theory is like it sounds. The idea is that this is a big system, meaning pieces that all interact, right? Your family is made up of individual people and pieces, but they're always interacting with each other. And they really can't be understood outside of each other, is what he's saying in this family systems theory. And one of the things that um, has been helpful for me in knowing family systems theory is if you look at larger systems theory, um, you recognize that the, what that kind of field says is you can't do too much about the environment you're in. As much as you want to try to change a system or change an environment, it's, it's near impossible to do. It, re- it really is, and certainly near impossible by a single – if it is when change is possible in systems, it's because lots of people have come together. There's been agreement. The people, the where the power is has agreed um, to try to change some a system without benefit of power and numbers and is near impossible. So just recognizing that for your family, I know I'm not alone in this sort of quest to want things to be different and to try to have them be different, and yet. It, you know, it's always the way it is. It's, it, it, it's, that's what this family systems theory tells us. We're going to keep getting those same results. Um, the results are destined from the start. It's bigger than any one piece. Um, every person in this family system is connected. Um, and, the, and in our cases, we didn't even know the connections that were there. Right? We didn't see them. They were hidden from us, maybe um, intentionally, maybe not intentionally, but we didn't, we didn't have a full picture. Um, also, all of the larger systems interplay, intersect with this. When, when there is, we do live in a culture that has racism and sexism and heterosexism, and those things are playing out in our families as well. They can't not, we can't, it's the fishbowl. We can't take any piece um, out of, out of it, out of context for it to work. Um, And also we all experience it through our own unique experiences, right? Um, Even, even twins have very different experiences in their family. Uh, and that's always important to know, right? It, we can think like our siblings are having the same, you, know, you grew up in the same family, but we, none of us have the same experience at, as much as we might be in the same time period. It doesn't make it the same experience. So that's always important to know as well. Um, the mobile picture, I think is like the best analogy for how family systems work. The pull in your family, and I think I said this on the next slide, um, we all, as individuals, our, our struggle is to kind of differentiate and connect, right? And that we all have that piece. Like, we all have recognized wow, we were different from people in our family. We were different than we were told. We were different than we thought. But also, do we still belong? Are we still connected? 
where are we connected to the new the new people the the people we start so much of our struggle is about that like the separateness but also the connectedness so that's just something to keep in mind for yourself and your healing as you're going through that you've got a, there's a lot going on we all know i think we say again and again how complex this situation is like there's just so much to it but it's also important for us to keep reflecting on how complex this is because it's difficult and there's reason like here's the date evidence of why we are all struggling in this um the other piece is history does tend to repeat itself because of these cycles and the the lack of awareness to it the lack of attention to it and when we are attending to it and looking at it and reflecting on it we're more likely to have a path that's freely chosen instead of just the repetition right we know in trauma you're one extreme or the other and you go back and forth so all of us have no choice but to really respond to our family we either are going to do it just the same way because we felt uh the things we needed to feel we felt cared about we felt secure we want to do that but we're going to do the opposite because we didn't feel that way right i've heard people in this group talk about you know living with um insecure you know, sort of just tangible insecurity and therefore focusing on making sure they had enough right or whatever kinds of you what things you didn't get you focus you want to correct you want to do it differently and it makes perfect sense human nature the sad thing about it is it, we don't get to have a freely chosen opinion about whatever the trauma is we can't help but be uh, stuck in all in or or all out um are the roles in families are just the kind of very basics of what do we expect with from each other how do we behave what how does a father act how does a mother act am i a good daughter am i a good sister what kinds of how are we all doing on these jobs where do we get these ideas about what these jobs should do um when you have an addict or a person with mental illness in your family and for many of us we did grow up with a wounded a parent who was so wounded from trauma that they manifested disorder um manifested sickness um and when that happens the whole family organizes around that sick person and trying to kind of keep it stable and trying to keep it just to just trying to keep it together um and many of us did have to organize around um uh, someone in authority who was not healthy uh their unpredictability their their violence a lot of times abusiveness their their hatred of us of themselves um their preoccupation with their own stuff and own needs whether by choice probably not by their choice but they are so they can't not focus on themselves deprives everybody else in the system of being able to do their stuff or work on their needs they have to work around the sort of wounded person so we many of us had to figure out how to adapt and how to go along to get along or whatever it may be I I know for me it it does manifest as you know, people pleasing and like running like trying to get things stabilized and making sure that the bear doesn't have reason to, like an obvious reason to attack um and that's a typical family pattern um and we're, I'm going to we're we're heading pretty soon into breakout rooms so um wanting to just have you think a little bit more about what are these family rules what does that mean and again these things aren't usually spoken they're not clear you've learned it and that's an important source of knowledge too like how did you learn the rules how did you learn what was expected of you sometimes it was um really by violent means that's how you learn 
or you saw, you saw what happened if you shared your feelings or you you saw other people in your family pay the price and those are the ways you learn things um and again we want you to think about and share about something that feels safe and okay to talk and share about some things are so challenging in families that they are not for a you know brief conversation so be thinking about something that feels like worth exploring worth talking about and and not too deep not too kind of buried and painful um and and we do think about doing the work of healing from trauma like unpacking luggage that idea of your baggage like it works because it, that is what it's like, right? You kind of have to, you can keep that tucked away in the basement for a long time, but oh, here it is. You, you know, the smell started to get real bad. You have to figure out what died in there. Um, and it is like a sort of a going through, like what's here? And is this something I want to keep? Is this something I want to throw? Is this something that's really causing harm in my environment and I didn't even see it, right? I can't tell you how many times during basement cleaning, I find a dead mouse in something, right? Like, and you're like, oh yeah, that's what that's from. Like these, you don't see them, but they're there. They're impacting the environment. <laughs> and so the unpacking of what this is. And so, you know, thinking about things to unpack, how was anger expressed in your family? Could people show it or do they keep it to themselves or were you allowed to be mad at some people but not other people and and what did, what did that do for you were people did they show each other kindness and affection and love emotion did they like being with each other did what were their expectations of you and of each other how did they make decisions in your family did did was it my way or the highway or did kids one specific kid get to their way all the time kind of what was going on there did you have input or did you just always have to go along um are there limits on how much and in what ways you you were allowed to fight did you did things get put a stop to was there real differences in how and when things got put a stop to how much were family members allowed to talk to people outside of the family about family problems? That's always a big one and one that we all have been, we often struggle with, right? Who knew? Who didn't know? Who had this information and who didn't? Because there's always rules in families about who you can tell things to. Um some of the things and the thinking, the, and again, this is like holding theory up to my experience personally and, work, and being with all of you, things that I've noticed, um, rarely were we seen for us in our family. What happened much more often was we were seen for what we've represented to the adults in our lives, right? So mom wasn't seeing you as you, Bradley. She is seeing you as maybe evidence of an affair or maybe shame or maybe um, the worst thing that ever happened to her or any, whatever was going on, seeing you as something for her, right? Like that, or, and that's often what was going on in, in families. People were treating you not for who you are or anything you do or didn't do, but what you are to them. Um, that I think I, I I know that resonates for many of you because that's how that is what happened. You, no matter what you do, who you are, you're gonna be this. In, in the minds of the people in your family. And that's one of the, the things we struggle with. Um, it is a basic human need for our, it, for our very survival to trust the people with power in our lives, our caretakers. Human beings come in not able to take care of themselves. I know many of you are parents, you know, these, we don't, we're not capable of taking care of ourselves 
for a good chunk of time, right? Like many of us learn to take care of ourselves way, way younger than we ever should have. And it's in some ways a miracle we survived to adulthood with the lack of care taken for our needs. Um, But that's important to know for yourself and to be kind to yourself. It's a huge source of meaning, I think, in this experience that we had, like, you need to trust the person taking care of you. If you don't, wow, like, there's not a good choice there, right? Um, It's a basic human need and instinct to trust your caretakers. But if your reality isn't lining up with what they're saying or what they're doing or what's healthy, your choice is, do I believe them or do I believe myself? It like it's a rare choice to believe yourself. It's not the safest choice to believe yourself. It makes a whole lot more sense to believe the people in power, right? And when that has been your experience, you've been taught to not trust yourself. When you've been taught to not trust yourself, that messes with your life in huge ways. Right. And, and that is a, that's a commonality, I think, of the, of our NP experience is we were told something that wasn't true. So at some level, many, you know, some people knew right away or did know at some level, whatever, what the story was and your experience didn't, didn't jive and you had to make sense of that. And most often the way we made sense of that was to think, we're wrong. We don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what we're feeling. We don't know what we're seeing. We don't know what we're experiencing. What they're telling us is really what's happening. And when that's what's going on for you, sets the whole stage for the rest of your life, right? It It is very common, I think, for people to recognize that have had childhood trauma. It shows up in their adult relationships because you didn't Take that, like, we don't really stop and reflect on, like, wow, what, like, I know for me, I was like, phew, got out of that family, jumped into this, um, without taking the time to think, like, was that really a healthy family? What did I learn there? Is that, all I went in with was, I'm not doing that same thing, right? And, um, that, and you end up doing that same thing because you're going, you're in the cycle that you haven't reflected on. Um, so learning that we weren't trustworthy and this was my biggest, um, like flash of insight was the recognition that safe and familiar were confusing to me, were confused in my mind that I thought of things as safe when they were familiar. And to me, familiar was, was scary chaos. And the fact that I would pick situations and people that were scary chaos like I, that was lost on me until sort of this, I took that step back and reflected on it. And when I did, I was like, Ooh, wow, that's not safe. And it actually took somebody else saying that to me. What about that person made you feel safe? They, they, and they posed it to me that way, like uh, causing me to have to reflect on that. And um, it was powerful. And, you know, we're hoping that those are the kinds of things that we're asking of you to do is to reflect and think about what what were some of those messages you got? And is that underlying some of the things that are going on now? Because how could it not be? Um, for For all of us, our experiences were not validated and not visible. A lot of times, right? People didn't said, nope, you're not ha- you're not being treated differently. Nope. That's not what's happening. Nope, that's it. That guy's the the one. He's all kinds of things that we were told weren't true. Um, And so that invalidates everything and makes you feel like you're not valid. You're not seen. You're invisible. Um, And you figure out how to manage that. I, I have described it as like it's the gaslight life. Right, that concept of gaslighting, where somebody makes you believe that you're they're right, and you're if there's a difference, they're the one who's right. They know better. If only you would get on board with their thinking, 
you'll be so much happier, right? That's how, that's what happened to all of us. We were con- tried to convince people convinced us that things were one way and they really weren't. And that, it, that leaves, leaves you no solid foundation. Many people have talked about the, like, I lose one half of my whole fa- family, my whole foundation, but it really is even more than one half. Your whole foundation is called into question through this experience. And that's what we need to just kind of like reflect on, look at, be aware of. So I, we are about to send you into smaller groups, um, but as you're going into them, we just want to ha- give a little bit of direction. We do hope, too, that people are going to be able to um, to be there for each other through the, the this time. Um, we recognize we are all experts in our own experience. So we would never say to somebody, no, that didn't happen to you. That's already, we're not repeating that for people telling them that they're wrong or they saw it wrong or in so we it's important to make sure you validate the experiences of your of people as they're talking to you and recognize we're all in different places this is easy for us to see when we when we do live you know zoom groups when from almost all of us when we came in we were messes. We were really struggling. We were like, felt so anxious. And, you know, I know I was checking every second to get into the group because I was so anxious and amped and uh, couldn't contain it. Um, But then you calm down. So like all of us have been at different places and that's what we're going to see in each other as well. Um, Our journeys may have very different destinations and we get to decide for ourselves what is best. Some people reconciling with family um, of origin is a beautiful thing to do. That will be great and healthy for them. But for many others, that is not the safest, healthiest thing to do. Um, So just letting people decide for themselves. And even if you see it differently, maybe they'll come to see it the way you see it too. But be with them where they are, not where you think they should be. Um, And same for yourself. There's not right or wrong answers in anything in this realm because our experiences are all so unique. Sometimes people are like, well, what should I do about this? What should I do? Like there's not ever one answer or a perfect answer. There's all we can offer to each other is things to consider. Like, I don't know what you should do, but think I would think about this or I would think about that. So just keep in mind there if somebody's asking you what to do, you don't know. They don't know. Nobody knows. Here's things to consider, though. Um, and the reason this is effective and important is it's so much easier for us to see other people's patterns than to see our own. It's I, it's the source of comedy for me in my mind, like how much I can so easily see other people's trauma. Like I... To me, I could, uh, like they're wearing it right on their sleeve. I could, but no, not all. <laughs> it's all news to me as uh, that's on my sleeve. Wow. Um, so that is part of what, why we benefit from being in groups with each other and from giving and receiving help, right? We're all in a position to help each other because we have a unique perspective. We have our own stuff that we're coming with. We're here for this. We're in this experience together, and we value each other in this. So it is the kind of the gift we share to give each other some time and space in small groups. So um, just, you know, uh, try to um, – and I'll turn it over to Brad, too, if he has any other thoughts or directions. And I, I've been talking the whole time. Um, but we would like to just make sure that in small groups of – three or four, you're going to give focused attention. We don't want to be so prescriptive of like take turns, but kind of because we want to make sure everybody does get uh, time to speak. It's very easy to get, want to go into somebody else's um, story because it resonates with you or yours was the same or, but we want to try to just make sure that people get some, everybody gets some time to tell their story and and be um, heard. 
So we're asking you to try to, you know, do what you can to make sure that happens. If so, and it's the hardest thing. If somebody is talking and they're in, and their story is really has a lot of feeling and you're right there with them, like you don't want to say, hey, you've been talking a lot. Like that, that feels crappy. But we also know it's really important for everybody to get some time. So do your best with that and thinking about it as don't let the same person speak twice until everybody's gotten a chance to go once. And that is our, our vision, I think, for the, the time is get everybody kind of goes around and, and says something about what they learned in their family or how these are thoughts and ideas apply in their life. Um, and then maybe a second go around where you can reflect back and say what you, you know, wow, when you shared that, Mary, I really heard something that resonated for me too. And so, so that there's, there's space for both, if that makes sense. Um, and if you're, if you're not able to give um, time and attention, then, you know, let, let, people know or pause, whatever, whatever makes sense. Um, but that is the ask. Bradley Hall, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I just I want to, I just had a conversation recently with someone <laughs> about how much, um, how much information we have coming at us every day and how little reflection time we get. So with this breakout group, there's, there's two things here. One is so you can tell your story. We know that's cathartic. We know that's therapeutic. The more you t we tell it, the more we normalize it. We're actually working through it while we're talking about it. But the second part here is, is, is listen to what the other participants are saying. You're going to find, one, that there's a lot of similarities. You're going to find things that are different. You may also find a new perspective on how to look at your situation and, and maybe navigate. And that's what this is for, so we can all learn from each other. So both of those things should be happening simultaneously while you're in here. Um, does anyone have any questions before we go to the breakout groups? Does it sound okay? Like the, the, the intent, the thing. And then I think Brad's going to do random group assignment, right? Um, and put like three or four people in a space. So if there, if anything comes up and you're like, I don't want to do that, you can come back out, I think. And he yes. could pop you in somewhere else. Yeah, um, there's. There's and no we'll mandatory just... participation here. This is all voluntary. Uh, and if you, and if you, including if you don't want to participate and including if at some point you it become emotional, become overwhelmed and you need, need a moment, you take your time, you do what you need to do. We will all be here. We have, we're going to have, um, let's see, what time is it now? 1.50 PM Eastern time. Okay, good. Yeah. So our intent was to give you like 45 minutes. Does that sound good? And then we're figuring if there's max of four people, that still gives like 11 minutes a person of total talk time. Um, so that that's our thought. So it, it should be uh, hopefully enough time. It never will feel like enough time, but we're hoping that it's a good enough chunk that you can get into some stuff. Sound all right? And we'll, we'll be, you know, we might be in the bathroom or getting coffee, but we'll be around too if you need to, you know, come out and check in or we'll be in the, I think you can make it so we're not assigned, right, Brad? I don't know. Brad's, Brad is just technology guy. Yeah. About okay. He's, been all the tech. He's working hard to rock okay. the tech. Did you get Catherine and Sharon in? Uh, Catherine is here, but we're having trouble getting, still getting Sharon in. She thinks it might be her internet oh. for some reason. So. Okay. Yeah, Aww. I've been I've been steadily working with her for 45 minutes and we just can't try two oh, different no. ways. I even gave her the direct link and it's not working either. So, um, oh crappy. Yeah, I'm we can give we'll give some time uh, um, warnings too. We can broadcast out like you know 50, 30 minutes left. Yeah, we'll do the 15 minute. We'll do 15 minute increment reminders. Okay. So, Here we go. Right. See you on the flip side. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, you know, it struck me in the breakout group that, you know, at least at least two or three, the, at least half the group is still in the midst of processing their trauma. And some of you know my story. I made my discovery 27 years ago, and um, I, I came out the other side after about two decades. And 
<laughs> and I don't think it has to take two decades because of groups like this, because of the emerging field in mental health that's dealing with this. Um, I think it's more than a couple months, but it's probably not a couple of decades. It might, but it might be a couple of years. Um, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And I just want to encourage everybody that's still in the middle of their process to trust that there is light at the end of the tunnel. You can get through it and come out the other side. Yeah, very, I, I appreciate you saying that. That's one of the hardest things to see, as we know. Um, and, and Catherine, you could probably speak to what Richard's talking about. I know that just in the time that I've been in the group, the, the recovery time seems to be accelerating because we do have uh, more people participating in resources and, and the support that Richard was talking about. But you're the one that started this whole thing. Um, I, I, do you see that pattern developing as well? I, I do. The, the more resources that are, that are available, including other groups that are out there, um, wherever you can find healing, it's, it's going to obviously speed things along. Um, and plus we're all comparing notes and sharing on what worked for us in our, in our process of making, finding our peace again. Um, so yeah, I think that that helps fast track all of this, but especially now that we've got more of an organizational, uh, system in place in the mental health community, thanks to people like, like Brad and Amy, uh, and Dr. Paulette Bethel. Um, and if, and I urge anyone who's here in this group, if you've ever felt a desire to, um, to turn your MPE experience into a way to help other people, please consider joining the coaching program. And Bradley can share more about that anytime you want to talk to him. Yeah, and I, I'd actually, um, I, I appreciate you pointing that out. I'd like to also acknowledge we have two new uh, trauma recovery coaches here in the room uh, with us, Richard McFarland being one and Ellen Farley being, being the other. Um, <laughs> So congratulations to both of them for graduating from the NPE uh, coaching program. And they're, they're, I'm available. They're available uh, for coaching if, if anyone uh, is interested in that. Um, to go back and talk about uh, the first, if you don't know, the first and third Wednesday, we have a discussion group uh, that can be found in the events section of the big NPE group. Uh, but we also have on the second and fourth Wednesday, uh, Amy and I facilitate a private uh, MP group called the MP Experience. This is part of this website here, um, and it's part of uh, of a membership called the MP Experience. Um, it's twenty seven dollars a month, and um, there we're we're going to have about ten support meetings total, and we're adding all kinds of new courses. Um, and I, I want to show you that here in a second. But the first thing I want to kind of slide into sharing my screen and um, show you that we are planning the, the MP Awareness Virtual Retreat in June. Trying to make this whole thing fit here. Okay, so, yeah, so uh, this is the MP Virtual Retreat uh, coming up in June, and uh, we're going to have Kimberly Weeks is a trauma recovery coach. She's not an MP, but she's a trauma recovery coach who specializes in narcissistic abuse. Uh, Brianne Kirkpatrick is a genetic counselor. She's going to um, give us the uh, science of family discoveries and DNA testing a review of the latest research um, that she's come across, as I mentioned earlier. And Bobby Parrish is the founder of the International Association of Trauma Recovery Coaches, and she's going to give uh, her presentation on MPE trauma and why she calls it its trauma with a capital T. Um, so we'd love to have you join us for this. As well, it's uh, June 11th, as you can see on there. And it's also uh, for those of you that that didn't uh, pay, the, that decided to join the NP experience for today rather than uh, just the single admission, your membership as an in, the NP experience, uh, your admission here is free. It's also free to moderators as well. Um, And I want to share with that the list of courses that are coming up. We're, we're really excited. We got a lot of really cool stuff coming up and we're hoping to add more. But here's the list of the courses. So when you join MP experience, um, we have managed stress and anxiety. That's my eight week course on managing stress and anxiety. And some of the people here have been through that. Um, MP mindfulness sessions. Uh, I did 11 
mindfulness sessions for the NPE group, Catherine's NPE group in uh, the summer of 2019. Those are included. The NPE experience was last spring, and Amy and Dr. Paulette Bethel and I did the five-part series. That's included. Those recordings are included as well. Um, I have the role of meditation holistic healing, but also with Brianne uh, Kirkpatrick and May is going to launch writing it. Uh, writing is healing with Brianne uh, in May of 2022. Freedom from narcissistic abuse will be the new course in, with Kimberly Weeks in July of 2022. Cultivating a heart centered practice with Liz Waltz in August of 2022. And family systems uh, with Jamie Carter will be dr- coming in September 2022. So. I ju- we just wanted to share that we have a whole lot going on in the MP experience, and we're, we're hoping to add more to really, really fill this out and uh, create a supportive environment uh, with a lot of education. Education's the key to kind of raising the awareness. Yeah, and, I yeah, think so. Yeah, and we raise our awareness, and then we can use that information uh, to, in, in the supportive community network to discuss it. And really reinforces the difference between learning something and knowing something. And I think the, the community support helps us do that. So. <clears throat> and Richard, I just want to um, echo what you said earlier and appreciate it that this is a long, I, like two decades doesn't really surprise me. Like <laughs> it's a complex. There's so much to it. I often tell people like if you lived in um, trauma for 10 years, it, like give yourself five to undo it, right? Even if it takes half the time to undo the harm done, there's there's not really a lot of magic bullets to make you heal if you've had, you know, 18, 20, 25 years of dysfunction and abuse and gaslighting. Um, and I'm so impressed that you even managed to unpack it in 20 something. Um, and, and I think that, you know, you recognize and we all do too. We'll probably never will be all done. It, it comes back up. There's, I think like there's just so many aspects to it that I know I can't possibly get to until I feel, you know, like I can't get to the heritage piece until I feel better about the like rights, what, what's right in front of me, my family piece. So I, it, I think it, and as you said, it becomes less intense there's so much healing to be found amongst people that are are in this with you. And and I also love, David, what you said about, like, nobody's experience is the same no matter how similar it looks. And that's really important information just in life. You know, that's um, – Brad and I struggle with that. Whenever you're in places, people um, want to be understood. They want to be validated. But they also want to be seen for the unique person that they are and the different experience they bring. And – and when we don't do that, it that's the source of so much conflict and problems. So I appreciate that you, you know, your kind of willingness to recognize that none of us have all the answers or can completely understand. We never can, but it's so healing when we actually will just sit beside each other as we try to figure it out for ourselves. And we really appreciate that all of you do that with us and, you know, we're, we're here as, as NPEs right there yeah. in the pain and the struggle. Um, and I'd so like to, they, I'd like to jump in on the back end of that. Um, okay. And Richard, I'm sure you could attest. I know if you don't know Richard's story, it's a phenomenal story. And I suggest um, you get him to share that sometime, but it, this, it takes a couple hours, <laughs> I, but the, the healing is circumambulating, right? It, so many times we think we're good. We're like, I got this. But then something else comes back around. So staying engaged in the community, staying connected with people, um, you know, it's why in the 12-step program you have a sponsor, that kind of thing. So because just when you think you're feeling good, life is going to hit you with something else somewhere down the road. And as we're moving through this process, we move forward a couple steps, we're going to move back a step. We're going to move forward a couple steps, we're going to move back a step. And so one of the worst things we can do is just think, hey, I got this. I'm, I, you know, always know this is a process. You, we may get through life and it not come back up, but more than likely something somewhere, may, if we haven't done the work, is going gonna, is gonna to cause it to come back up. So um, don't, so be compassionate with yourself. Don't, over, don't have uh, too many expectations, over expectations, of, you know, just take it one day at a time, work through it. If you if you ha- if you have issues, fall back on your community that we have here. Um, that's what we're here for. 
and uh, just pick yourself back up and keep walking. That's what it's about. You know, um, I'm, I'm grateful all of you are here today. This is a great turnout. Um, I hope it was, um, I hope it was, if it, it was, I know it was eventful in the beginning for some of you, um, but I hope it was fruitful for all of you. Uh, we want you to know how much we appreciate you. Anything else you want to say, Amy? Um, Trauma Training Tuesday, the 19th of April on Trauma of Survival Mode. I'm totally excited. In, in my uh, day job, I'm uh, a trauma therapist, and I put on a monthly free series. Um, and all the recordings are available for people, too, on our Facebook page. But it's an expert with some lived experience, talks about every topic, um, and just this this woman's perspective on the idea that and it applies to our NP experience and our sort of COVID world experience. Like we really all have been in survival mode. Um, we're really just going from one thing to the next and healing doesn't even start. Healing hasn't even started um, for the, for what we've all been through. Um, and it's important for us to see that because it's going to continue. It's going to be hard. It's that like, it's, it's, I wish it was a beautiful horizon ahead and hopefully it is, but not without some pain before we get there. Come on. So that. (laughs) All right. right, Friends go with love. Yeah. So delightful. Thank you for all for coming. We hope you have a great weekend. Hope to see you soon. Thank you guys. All right. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks.